you would please stand for the reading of God's Word if you're able to. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, begin reading in verse 1, says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host, and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals, for within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan to go and to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. Look with me back in verses 1 and 2. It says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, and that's what he says here, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore arise, go over this Jordan. Thou and all this people unto the land which I give to them, even to the children of Israel. I'd like to preach a message I've titled, Called to Step Up. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this evening. Lord, we know that there's folks that are not able to be here tonight, Lord. Some are out of town, some are sick or whatever, Lord. But I pray that you just meet with us tonight in a special way. And those who are watching by live stream, Lord, I pray that uh, you would speak to hearts in a powerful way. So I pray that you would strengthen us to live for you and to serve you. Lord, in this day and time, definitely we need to be stepping up. Father, I pray now that you would just help each of us, Lord, to magnify you in our daily activities, Lord, whether it be with the neighbors, with the people at work, or whether it be our family, but, Lord, that we might magnify and proclaim your goodness. And we'll thank you, we'll praise you, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. As the book of Joshua opens, Moses has died, so the Lord goes to Joshua, the faithful right-hand man, you might say, of Moses, and, and basically, in effect, what he's telling him, Joshua, I want you to step up. I want you to take the position. I want you to step up. I want you to do something for me. And uh, I want you to lead my people into the land that I've promised them. And so, basically, he's telling Joshua, step up to the, to the plate. It's your turn now. And I think in our day and time, we look around and the, what is needed is people need to step up. We need to learn to, the, hey, listen, there's time to step up now and to do what the Lord has for us to do. Because time is short. The Lord's getting ready to come back. Not only that, but as things wax worse and worse, there's a greater need and we need to step up for the Lord and live in such a way that others can, to, will turn their hearts to Him. Back in the 1800s, a man by the name of Joshua Chamberlain, not Joshua, son of Nun, but Joshua Chamberlain. He was a professor who taught modern languages at a college in Virginia. He was very fluent in about 10 different languages, very fluent. He was not a, a, uh, a, a man of war. He had not studied any type of military tactics at all. But then about that time as the Civil War began, he joined up with the Union Army. 
As he joined up with the Union Army, they began to realize that they had a very special man in Joshua Chamberlain. Joshua Chamberlain was a very wise man, a smart man, and, and very quickly he began to climb the ranks, and they moved him very quickly up to Brigadier General. Brigadier General. And they began to use him in a, in a great way. He gained the fame then of, uh, of the Battle of Gettysburg. When he went there, he, he led the 20th Maine Volunteer Infantry Regiment at the defense of the, what they called the Little Round Top Hill. The Union Army faced several defeats in that, in that battle right at first. The, the Confederate Army would charge them and they would begin to fire upon the Union uh, soldiers and they, the Union soldiers, they lost a, a bunch of the Union soldiers and their ammunition uh, was being depleted. But uh, uh, Joshua Chamberlain realized, hey, we've got to hold this hill. We've got to keep this hill, this little round top hill. We cannot allow this to happen. At this particular time in Joshua Chamberlain's life, he had malaria and was weakened from that, but he was still leading on and still pressing on with, with this Union Army and, and defending this hilltop. He looked at the men and he said, there's only one thing that we have left to do that we've got to do. And he said, we've got to go into it. We've got to charge them with our bayonets. We have no other choice. And even though he was weakened with the malaria, he led the charge against the Confederate Army. It astonished them so much and, and took them off guard so much that they quickly surrendered. They captured several, uh, uh, over a hundred of them and, and took them in and, and, and they, you know, they, they had defeated them there and, and Joshua knew that, uh, that that was the only thing they could do. Well, as it went on, we find that Chamberlain, during that particular time, he was shot twice. And his wounds uh, uh, took him out of the battlefield for a, a, just a, a very short time. And he, they got him going again, and he went back to the battlefront again. As he was in the battlefront at different places during his service in the Army of the Potomac, uh, Chamberlain served in 20 different battles and many other skirmishes. He had six horses shot out from underneath him. He was wounded in six, at six different times at six different battles. Uh, he had received uh, and was cited for bravery four times. And each time that he was wounded, he would return to the battlefield at the earliest opportunity and ignore what the doctors had told him that he shouldn't go back, but he would still go back. He was a man that had stepped up. He was a man that nothing could hold him down. He was a man that was not a, was, had never studied war tactics, but was a very great man to be used in this battle for the Union. But the greatest day came when they was fighting there at Petersburg and he was shot through the right hip, through the groin, and he fell to the ground. He reached over and grabbed out his sword, stuck the tip of it in the ground and pulled himself up on the sword and propped himself up on the sword and began to encourage the rest of his men to keep on fighting. They said that he stood there and hollered and, and, and encouraged the men to keep on going and to keep on fighting. They said next thing they knew, he had collapsed because of loss of blood. He laid there on the battlefield and they thought he was dead. The word got around. They picked him up and they took him into the surgical tent. And word got around and they even published it the next day in a paper that Joshua Chamberlain was dead. Just the following day, they had to recant it and change it because Joshua Chamberlain was alive. And after the surgeries and after a little bit of time, he returned to his command. He stepped up. Because of him stepping up, the Union was able to win some great victories. Because Not because he was a man that had great battle tactics and had studied it all but because he was a man that stepped up in a time of need. We find that Joshua, the son of Nun, in the book of Joshua here, was a like kind man, that he was the minister. He helped Moses and, and, and no doubt had no intention of leading the children of Israel. But yet the Lord comes to Joshua 
and basically tells him, I need you to step up. I need you to take over. I need you to lead. Joshua stepped up in that time also. There was the call, you might say, for Joshua to step up. Look with me in verse 2. It says, Moses, my servant, the Lord speaking, he says, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over Jordan. He had not told that to any other man in all of Israel, but he told it to Joshua, the son of Nun. He said, Thou and all this people unto the land which I do give them, even the children of Israel. There was no need for someone to, or there was a need to step up and, uh, since Moses had died. Uh, what you find here, the need to, was to lead the children of Israel into the promised land, to, to lead them into their battles, to lead them into the obedience of God's commands while they were, when, once they got there and while they was going into the, to the, to, to, to the promised land, they were to follow the Lord. And, and it, was, it took a man of God to lead them into that. And, and the Lord said, Joshua, you're the one. I want you to step up. And I want you to do this. So Joshua did. Joshua stepped up. Just as Joshua Chamberlain stepped up and helped his men step in, up in the battles of, by his example, so did Joshua the son of Nun do likewise. Joshua stepped up to the call of God that he might lead others to step up to the call of God. If you go through the book of Joshua and and then you look at what took place. Joshua himself, he was able to lead other men that they would step up and that they would be captains and that they would be leaders of, of different groups and people as they went in and fought against the inhabitants of the land. He also helped them to step up and, and make a choice of who they was going to serve. You find over in Joshua chapter 24, uh, you find that he says, he, he says, you need to make a choice today. You need to choose who you're going to serve. Either the gods of uh, uh, the Amorites or, or the ones on the other side of the flood that your fathers worship. He said, but as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. He stepped up. He stepped up, not just into lead in the battle but to lead spiritually, to keep them in the direction. And you, as you read on, you find that all the days, all the days of Joshua, that they followed the Lord. And then after Joshua died, as those others that had stepped up because of Joshua, they followed the Lord. But sadly to say, if you read on, you find out that after Joshua died and after those who, who were under Joshua that had stepped up as they went in after they died, they began to go after the gods of the, of the, of the people, the, Canaan, uh, uh, the Canaanites and all of that land. Why? Because they needed somebody to step up. We're living day and time when these folks step up. There's a call for each of us as Christians to step up today. The Lord has a great work for us. You say, well, preacher, I've not been called to the ministry. Nobody's got a great work for you. In fact, the Bible says that we're all ambassadors for Christ. Every one of us. Every single person in this room, you're an ambassador for Christ. You're a representative. You are to, we, this is not our home. We're just passing through, as the song says. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Hey, listen, we're just, we're just ambassadors from another country now, you might say, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and we're to step up and take the Word of God to this world that they might know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Even Jesus said when He was here, in John chapter 9, verse 4, He said, I must work the works of Him that sent me while His day, the night cometh when no man can work. There's coming a day when it will be too late. There's coming a day when the Lord's going to catch us out of here. There's coming a day when it becomes harder and more difficult. We need to step up now. We must step up now instead of putting it off uh, for a more convenient day. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16 says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Hey, listen, if you haven't read the papers, if you haven't looked at the, at the news, if you haven't been listening to anything that's going on, we're living in the evil days right now. I mean, when a world can look around and you can see all the wickedness and the vileness that's going on and the perversion and, the, and we could go on and talk about all of it. Hey, listen, it's at new heights today than it ever has been before. And we're living in an evil day. It's a time for us to step up. 
So many times I look around and you find people that say, what can't be done? It can if we'll step up. We find over in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 10, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, notice what he says here, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Otherwise, we should step up and serve the Lord and live for the Lord. Magnify the Lord with our lives. Reach the lost with the gospel. Encourage Christians to live on for the Lord and magnify Him. Well, Joshua no doubt needed encouragement here. If you kind of, you know, you can kind of read some things. If you read that down through there and you, you, you don't see it unless you stop and think about it. But reading kind of between the lines here, you might see what the Lord told Joshua that, and everything, we, that uh, we see the Lord encouraging Joshua. And when you see how much he's encouraging him here, it kind of, if you look between the lines, it's like Joshua's like, oh, buddy, I don't think I can do this. Eh, you, I think you picked the wrong person. Are you sure you, I, boy, I tell you what, I, I'm not a Moses. And the Lord began to encourage him. In fact, in four verses there, verses 6 through 9, you'll see him encouraging him three times about being courageous and about being strong. First, God encouraged Joshua through a promise. Notice what, what he says here in verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Notice what he says, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. He's going back. He said, listen, I made a promise. He said, I'm going to keep my promise. I'm a promise-keeping God. So he was encouraging Joshua here that he was going to uh, uh, use him to keep a promise that to, he had made to Abraham about six centuries earlier. Six centuries earlier. He said, I'm going to keep a promise I made way back then, and I'm going to use you to do it. Why? Because he says, I'm a promise-keeping God, a covenant-keeping God. When you step up and accept God's call to serve him and share his message with others, you can do so with courage and confidence because he has promised that he'll never fail you. You know, one of the greatest things, one of the things we got, and I've got a book downstairs somewhere, and, it, and, and I've never went through and, and, and looked at all of them and checked it all out, but it talks about how many promises are in the Bible. Now, truth would be not all those promises are for us, okay? Some of those promises are only for Israel. But it, it's loaded with promises that affect all of us, every single person. And so... There are, some, there are special promises, but there, is a, uh, there are promises, uh, could I put it this way? There are a ton of promises that is for every born-again Christian who will follow the Lord, who will trust the Lord, who will, could I put it again this way, who will step up and follow God and do what He says to do. You see, you don't have to worry. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to concern yourself with the outcome because... You trust in the promises of God. He keeps every promise. Yes. Every promise. Not just one or two of them, but every promise. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9, he says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is, the, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. To a thousand generations. He's a covenant-keeping God. What's a covenant? It's a promise. He's a merciful God. He's a faithful God. And he says, listen, he said, if you will step up, if you will follow me, if you will obey me, he said, then I, I'm going to keep my promises to you. My promises. With most of the promises that you will find in the Bible, you will find that there is a, uh, what could I say, there is a requirement to get that promise. And, but God says if you'll, meet the pro, if you'll meet the requirement. And it's not beyond our ability to keep that. He says I'm going to keep my promise to you. 
Then secondly, not only was he, was he encouraged by God saying, I'm going to keep my promises, and he could trust God because God's a promise-keeping God. Secondly, he encouraged Joshua with the power of his word. Look with me in verse 7 and 8 there. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all, what's the next? The law, the word of God. He said, be courageous to do that. Which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest be prosperous whithersoever thou goest. He said, don't stray from it one way or the other. He said, if, you'll, if you will follow that, he said, I'm, he said, I want you to know I'm going to be with you. It's powerful. I'm going to prosper you if you will stay straight down the line with my word. Look at verse 7. Or verse 8, rather. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. We want to stop there just for a second. The Bible, God's Word, is not a smorgasbord. Where you pick and choose what you want, what you like, and what you don't want, and what you don't like. We are to keep the Word of God. Now, true, we're not under the law. But the law is a schoolmaster for us. And it helps direct our lives. We're under grace. But we are to follow the Word of God throughout. We are to learn from it. We're to, to take it and we're to apply it to our hearts and our lives and let it guide us and direct our days. Too many people want to pick and choose and, and they want to leave out the Old Testament and say, well, we're under grace, so with, you know, the Old Testament, it's all law. No, my friend, Jesus said that he didn't come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. And so it's been fulfilled and we're under grace. And so we have a new covenant, but yet he tells us, he said, Do according to all that is written therein, for then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. He promised him, he encouraged him, he said, listen, if you'll follow my word, if you'll obey the commands of God, he said, I'll bless your life. Folks, I'm going to tell you something here tonight as a Christian. You want the blessings of God? Obey his word. Don't try to shortcut it. Don't try to work around it. Just take it for as the Lord gives it and obey it. And God said that he would prosper your life. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to become a millionaire. That doesn't mean that, that you're never going to have problems. In fact, if you look at the life of Joshua, he had a bunch of battles to fight. After the Lord had made this promise to him, and after he encouraged him of keeping the law that he would prosper him, he had to go in and still had to fight. He still had to put up with a bunch of hard-headed Israelites that, that didn't want to do what God told them to do. He still had to try to keep them in line. He still had to, to lead them. He still had to guide them. He still had to, to fight the battles with the enemy there. And still had to do the work that needed to be done and dividing up the land. And, and some of them uh, bickered about this and bickered about that. And, and different things took place. But still yet, God prospered him. Why? Because he followed the Word of God. In your life and in my life, God says, you want me to keep my hand on your life? Do you want me to prosper your life? Obey my word. He tells us in different scripture, we could go different ways, and how that it watches over us and guides us. It's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. The word of God is. He says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. That's following the word of God, putting it in your heart. He tells us that it's, it's powerful and sharper than any two edged sword. It's powerful. And doing, and doing battle with, with, with the enemy and doing battle against sin that comes your direction. We see the example of the Lord Jesus Christ himself as Satan comes to tempt him and how he takes it each time and he says, it is written. And he takes the word of God and defeats him with the word of God. We can go on and we can go on and, and, and through the scripture and you can find how that the word of God will prosper you and me if we will obey it. 
And we can be encouraged. Wait a minute. Hey, listen, if I go through this life and there's battles in my life, if I will obey this book, hey, listen, it will prosper me and I will win the battles and I will be able to stand for God and God will, will bless his word. He, in fact, the Lord said that his word would not return unto him void. That's powerful. It's a powerful book. He said, do according to it. Because it's powerful. It'll prosper your life. As I said, the Lord is not promising that life will be easy for the, for, the, for the believer. But that if we'll obey God's word and stand firm on it, that he'll be standing with us when everything falls apart. You stop and think about things are falling apart in this world. But if you'll stand with the word of God, you'll still be standing while everything else crumbles. Why? Because God honors his word. And thirdly, we see here how he encouraged him. Thirdly, God encouraged Joshua by his presence if he would step up. Look at verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. So the Lord gave Joshua a third word of encouragement that he would walk alongside him throughout all the battles, throughout all the crises that he would face, throughout all the struggles. He said, I will walk with you. I will be with you. Before this, possibly Joshua might have been thinking, you know what, it's good to have the promises of God. And it's good to have scripture verses. But what good's that against a bunch of giants and that's armed with swords and spears? But the Lord saved, I would say, the most important or the greatest of encouragement for last in telling Joshua that you won't face your battles alone. That he would be there with him and for him wherever he goes. You know what? We have the encouragement of the promises of God. He's never once failed us on his promises. No, we, have the, we have the encouragement of his word and the power of it and how he said that he would prosper us. And, and my friend, if, you, if, you've, if you've been following the word of God, you know that he's prospered you because of it. Yeah. But the greatest of all is when he says, I'll go with you. Amen. I'll be with you. And notice what he said, whithersoever thou goest. He said, I'll go with you. It don't get any better than that. If you remember what Moses said, when he told, when, when uh, the Lord was going to send him up and uh, with the people, the people had sinned against God in, in making the golden calf and, and how that, that, that they was a hard, stiff-necked people and God said that, that he was going to just wipe them out and, and Moses begged him not to because uh, it would bring dishonor to the Lord's name that the, everybody else said, well, he led them out of Egypt, but he couldn't, he couldn't bring them into Canaan. And Moses said, just cut me off then with them because and, 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 God said, I'll make, another, I'll make another nation of you. And he said, no, don't do that. And then the Lord said, okay. He said, I'm going to let you take them on in to, into, into Canaan, but I'm not going. He said, I'm not going to go. Go ahead and take them in, but I'm not going. And Moses' reply was, if you don't go up with us, then don't send us up. If you're not going to go up with us, I don't want to go. God had Moses to move the, the tabernacle out away from the people. And he met with Moses on the outside of the camp because of the sin of the people. Moses knew how important it was to have the presence of God for the Lord to be with him. And he knew that you could not maintain sin in your life 
and not get it right with God and have the presence of God. Can I tell you something tonight, Christian? Hey, listen, we need to make sure that, that we keep a short account with God and keep that sin confessed and keep it right with God and walk with God so that He will be with us, that He will always be in our presence and go up with us. He, he said, I'll go up with you. Uh, 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 I'll go up with you, Joshua. I'll go up with you. I'll, wherever you go, I'll be with you. But you know what? We have a promise from God. Already that says that he's going to go with us. You see, in that day and time, there is a little bit different than it is today. It's such a great promise for you and me today if we will step up and serve the Lord and, and live daily for him. He told us, he's already given us the promise in Hebrews 13, 5, the last part. He says, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Same thing he told Joshua. He said, I'll be with you wherever so ever you go. Matthew 28, 20, as he was, it was departing, he gave he give the command to go out in the highways and hedges and, 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 and preach the gospel and teach others and, and to uh, uh, take the, the gospel to the whole world. And there in Matthew 28, 20, he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And he says, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Christian, do you realize you should be encouraged by the fact that God says, I will be with you. Amen. Wherever you're at, I will be with you. We ought to be encouraged because of the word of God and the power that it has and, and what, how it directs and guides our lives. We ought to be encouraged by the promises of God that he keeps you realize that because of this, that Joshua could say victory is already ours? Why was it, preacher? Because he stepped up. Do you realize that when God asks you to step up, if you'll step up, the victory is already yours? That doesn't mean that you're not going to have to fight. That doesn't mean there's not going to be hard times. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be struggles. But the victory is already won. Amen. Because of the promises and because of the word of God and because of the presence of God. We can be content to live in the shadows or we can step up for the Lord. A lot of Christians are just sitting back. Good Christians, good folks. Not out there, they're not out drinking and drugging and everything else and in immorality and all that stuff, but they're just kind of sitting back, not doing anything, not living for God, really. You say, well, preacher, you're not living against Him. No, but what, what are they doing for Him? The Lord wants us to step up, not, listen to me, not sit down. I'll say it again. The Lord wants us to step up, not sit down. And too many Christians are sitting idly by when God is saying, I want you to step up. I want you to live for me. I want you to get the gospel out. I want you to get people into my house. Go out on the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. When he wants us to step up in, 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 our, in our fellowship with him, when he wants us to step up in our prayer life with him, when he wants us to step, step up in our, in our walk with him daily. He wants us to step up and take the Word of God. We can be content or we can step up. Notice again what that opening verse declared. Look at verse 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses... My servant is dead. There, now therefore, he said, since he's dead, therefore arise, go over Jordan, this Jordan. God's servant's dead. In that day, the Lord chose someone to be anointed by the Holy Spirit of God 
Moses had that anointing on him. Moses had that hand of God on him. Moses spoke with the Lord face to face. You go on through and and if you jump over into the book of Judges, what you'll find that in the book of Judges that, the, that, that after Joshua had died and, and the people went out into sin and they began to, to follow the other uh, uh, pagan religions and, and worship the idols and stuff like that, that God would sell them out into, uh, send them out into bondage through the other countries and stuff. And after they had been there and had been abused and, and went through very difficult times and hard times, they would begin to cry out unto the Lord to, to deliver them. And God would raise up an anointed, spirit-filled judge. And then he would lead the people out. God would bless him because he's following God and getting the people to come back to God and follow the Lord. And, and then he would judge for a while and then he would die. And shortly after that, they would go back again. They would go back. It was a, it was a downward spiral. You've often heard me say it was a downward spiral. They was constantly, and then they would have to be, they'd cry out again. And then God would raise up a, another judge anointed by the Spirit of God and the, the power and the hand of God is on him. You know, look at what he says to Gideon. Calls him the man of God. And so there was men that was raised up during that time with that special anointing. But now that we're under grace, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, we all have received that anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. He didn't stop there. He says, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Now, wait a minute. Did it say that that is the preacher? In a roundabout way, yes. Did he say that is the deacon? In a roundabout way, yes. Did he say that's the Sunday school teacher? In a roundabout way, yes. But if you want to know the truth about it, he said that about all of us, every person who knows Jesus Christ as their Savior has that anointing, has the Spirit of God dwelling within them. And so therefore he's saying, step up. Step up. It's time to live for the Lord. It's time to serve God. It's time to, to lay aside the things of this world and to step up. Don't hang back in the shadows. Could I ask you tonight, who's going to step up in our day to pay, take the place of the saints of God who have went on to be with the Lord? I think of different ones. I think about Brother Jim Thomas. Who's going to step up and take Brother Jim's place? I think about a man that, a godly man that was my my song leader and friend and, and we went soul winning together and Duke Etherton. Who's going to step up and take Duke's place? Think about my pastor. Godly man. Elmo Parker. Who's going to step up? Say, yeah, preacher, but those, you know, those are special people. I think about little Ida Vinoy down in Piedmont when I was in high school. Love God. Oh, she loved God. She'd sit in those services. She'd sit right there in that seat right there. Woo! Amen, preacher! Woo! Amen! Praise the Lord! God's good. She'd start shuffling them feet back and forth. The only place that there was any carpet was in the middle and had hardwood floors. And she did wore the, the, uh, the, 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 the shellac or whatever off of the floor down to just plain wood. 
And this teenage boy was moved by that. Who's going to step up to take out of Anoa's place? Who's going to step up to take the place of Sister Myra Bavak sitting in a wheelchair in pain 24 hours a day? You say 24, she had to sleep sometime. She slept about 30 minutes at a time. Maybe got three hours a day in so much pain. She'd come to church in that little in that wheelchair and she had a stick and she had a hanky on it. Her hands was all deformed and warped up from the, from the, uh, 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 from the arthritis and stuff that was crippling and, and keeping her in so much pain. It's on a stick. And I'd still see her. That stick. I'd get ready to go preach a revival. She said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Mattoon, Illinois. I'm going to preach Calvary Baptist, Mattoon, Illinois. She said, I'll be praying for you. I'd get back. She said, how many got saved? I said, you must have been praying hard as 14 got saved. Amen. And she said, well, where are you going this weekend? I said, I'm going to camp. We go to camp. She said, I'll be praying every night, every day. It might be 20 some get saved. Come back. I said, man, you must have been praying. I said, how many Jeff say? I said, there's 20, 20 some. And she'd pray. Who's going to step up in Myra Bavak's place? Who's going to step up? Those dear saints of God. Those who led you to the Lord. Those who pointed you to Jesus Christ. Those who kept the fire rolling in the pew. Kept the preacher stirred and fire on fire for God. Who's going to step up? Who's going to step up and magnify the Lord in, in Marshall? Who's going to step up and, and take the gospel in Marshall? Who's going to step up and, and, and reach the lost of this area? Who's going to step up and, and train the next generation of Christians to, to live for God and not for self? Who's going, to be the, who's going to step up and make an impact for the Lord in our town? Who's going to step up and, and pray and seek true revival? Who's going to stand up and, and, and step up and stand for righteousness in, in a dark world in our, in our day and time? You say, preacher, it's got to be somebody out there that can do it. I'll tell you who it is. It's you and me, every single one of us. God's saying, hey, listen, most Moses is dead. It's time to step up, Joshua. Amen. See, my name's not Joshua. Well, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Preacher, I can't do much. You're right. But God can. Preacher, I don't know what to say. No, but God does. Preacher, I feel so, so unable to do anything good. That way God gets the glory. That way you depend on the Lord. He's just saying step up. Preacher, what do I need? You've got everything you need. You've got the Spirit of God. You just need to step up and follow him. Go the direction he leads you and guides you. We can step up to the call of God or we can be content to sit back and watch souls plunge off into a lake of fire. And then it will be said of us as it was in the book of Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30 says, And I sought for a man among them. That should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. But I found none. Didn't say I only found five, only found four, only found three, only found two, only found one. He said I found none. None of them would step up. You see, it's a lot easier to sit in a pew. It's a lot easier just to go to church. God's glad that you're here. God's glad that you come to church. God's glad you read your Bible, but he wants you to step up. What would happen 
if it would be like the, the, the upper room uh, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as they gathered together and they waited upon the Lord and, and, the, and the Spirit of God came down and, and God used them in a powerful way and, and added souls on the day of Pentecost over 3,000. Why? Because they all stepped up. Or it could be, let us be like Isaiah and step up and say, as Isaiah did also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. See, what's he saying, preacher? Isaiah saying, I'm stepping up. We can be content to just be an average Christian and see nothing really happen. Or we can get a burden in our soul and say, Lord, I want to step up. And you know what? When that happens, God's going to empower you with his word. He's going to encourage you with his promises. And he's going to be there with you through it all as you step up for him. We've been called. Who's been called, preacher? We have. All of us. If you know Jesus Christ, you're saying, we've been called to step up. To step up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you. Thank you for the promises that encourage us. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that you filled us with our spirit. Now, Lord, help us to have a vision, an understanding that we need to step up. And may we be obedient. May we be like Isaiah and say, here, my Lord, send me. And sending me may be across the street. It could be around the world. It may be next door. It may be to our family. It may be to the person at the grocery store. But Lord, you want us to step up. And you've gave us every promise. You've given us every encouragement to carry us through. Tonight, Lord, I pray that there would be folks that would find a place here at the altar and say, Lord, like Joshua, I'm going to step up. Have your one way in the invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with your heads bowed?